This is a famous painting dating back to the year 1556, now preserved in the Gulistan Museum in Iran. Among the varied and intricate details, one can discern the images of a young prince showing a picture to a bearded figure donning a typical Central Asian headdress. This was Humayun, the Mughal emperor, and the young prince was the future emperor, Akbar. Akbar at that time was barely 13 and was trying his hand at painting. This was an art that much fascinated the young prince. He had two illustrious teachers, the Persian artists Abdus Samad and Mir Said Ali. These two master painters had impressed Humayun during his visit to the court of Shah Tamasp of Persia. In 1549, on Humayun's invitation, the two masters came to Kabul and set up on a moderate scale the famous Mughal Tasweer Khana or the Imperial Studio. This, in short, was what scholars consider the true beginning of the Mughal painting. Akbar's training in art possibly never went beyond the rudiments, but his future efforts in organizing the numerous talented artists under one roof was perhaps the most significant development in the history of Mughal art. Jahangir, we start the most important part of the story of Mughal painting, serving as a record to the visual imagination of a patron. Jahangir was born mainly after Akbar had sent up many prayers and the birth of this son was longed for for many years. The particular painting which shows the birth of Jahangir is a very important one in the Akbar Nama. Here we see the harem, but most probably most of the figures are imagined, though their lifelike postures and their expressions make it quite clear that this is how the world of women who guarded the infant who was to be the later king uh, should appear to later audience. Jahangir was one of the most involved patrons of Mughal painting. He claimed that he could uh, recognize the brush stroke of each of his painters, and in a way that was correct. His, among his portraits are to be found a number of allegorical uh, paintings which testify to the mythopoeic role that he had set himself as a king. Here we have the first painting where he is seen holding up the globe, which symbolizes also his name Jahangir, the world gripper. see that almost all the incidents in the life of the emperor, which is considered to be important, was to be recorded through painting. Just as if there was, in the case when photography was discovered about royal portraiture, how, you know, portraits were to be uh, used as a record of his empire and rule, in the same way, 
painting from the Jahangiri period onwards recorded every incident in the life of the emperor which he thought important. One of this was visiting the saints and conversing with learned men and poets. Jahangir himself considered that to be a very important activity and he himself was considered to have been very fond of poetry and art. So both are combined in this particular painting where he is seen to be visiting the religious men. Quite uh, at a late stage of his life, almost at the age of 40, Jahangir went to visit the Dorga of Mainuddin Chisti. The man after uh, Selim Chisti, who was the son of Mainuddin Chisti, was the, was the saint to whom uh, Jahangir's birth was also ascribed and he had the name of the saint Selim. So his visit of Mainuddin Chisti's Dorga was actually a homage both to his own origin and to the fact that how the Mughal dynasty venerated the Chisti uh, saints. Now here we have Jangi sitting and food is being distributed among the poor people and the Darveshes are coming to visit him. Here you find the excellence of the painting, the way light is being treated, the way the whole natural background is seen to emphasize the, the purity and the sanctity of this particular shrine. We have here the Darveshes who are visiting him and each portrait shows that each man has a different kind of expression. At the same time, we have with the difference of clothes, gestures, the individual identity of all the holy men established. This is what Mughal painting was ultimately able to achieve. It gave us as records of history that visual reality which it was impossible to get in any other medium. Here we have a part, a detail of that painting where we see that Jahangir is having food distributed among the beggars. Each of the face of the beggars are individual portrait studies, which makes it quite clear that the Mughal artist, when asked to paint a particular scene, did not only pay attention to the ruler or the patron. His attention was given equally to even the poorest of the poor and it is through their achievement that the poor in the period of the Mughals come alive to us. We come to recognize the poor people as well as the rich people and identify them as subjects of a benevolent empire. veneration for European painting and it is through the pursuit of European paintings that the Mughal painters actually reached that point of objective realism which it was not possible for them to do before. Here we have Jahangir looking at the portrait of Mary. At the same time, almost in the same stance, we have Jahangir holding up the portrait of his father in which Akbar is painted in complete white and he is holding the globe which signifies his sovereignty. And we must remember that Jahangir also when commissioning this painting must have remembered that he had once rebelled against his father. But what it really signifies is that the throne was to pass from father to son 
and the law of promulgation is to be observed. One of the allegorical portraits of Jahangir shows him to be shooting at poverty. The old, old man is supposed to symbolize poverty. The European cherubs are supplying Jahangir with arms. He is standing on the globe, crystal globe, where there is the lion and the sheep, uh, signifying the dynastic rule of the two Safavid families, one the Mughal and the other Iranian. And at the bottom is the fish from whose belly emerges Monu, the Hindu lawgiver. Now, the, each of these symbols were carefully selected. And the inscriptions write on the painting that these were all chosen by Jahangir himself. This very important painting shows the visual ideology of the Mughal ruler as we have never been able to see in any other records that have been left by Jahangir or his biographers in this period. We have here another allegorical portrait of Jahangir where he is embracing the Shah, Shah Abbas of Iran. The background signifies the sun and moon, which uh, is a testimony to Jahangir's name. There are the angel heads. Jahangir is standing on a lion and Shah Abbas on the sheep, which are dynastic symbols of both these rulers. And we find that Jahangir's lion is almost pull, putting uh, Shah Abbas's sheep out of the globe. Now, this is all supposed to signify Jahangir's might and the control that he had over both the kingdoms. This is the last of the iconography of Jahangir, where he is giving the book, the Quran, back to the holy man from whom he was supposed to have used the crown. The two other men uh, who are standing around his, three other men rather, who are standing around his throne are supposed to be the Sultan of Turkey, King James of England, and the other man who might have been the ruler of Bijapur or might be the artist himself. We have the two figures of the Cupids who are crying because they can, cannot attach Jahangir anymore. Jahangir has gone beyond time because he's sitting on the hourglass, which has become his throne, where the angels are writing his name. It shows that Jahangir has become immortal. This heavily laden uh, symbolic portrait of Jahangir shows that uh, the Mughal rulers were quite aware of the significance of painting and that from now onwards, there would be a series of these allegorical portraits which could be considered as the hallmark of royal court portraiture. It was in the period of Jahangir that we have some of the best examples of what the Mughal artist had achieved in terms of realism. Here we have two works, one which is a drawing of a man called Enayat Khan, who was a courtier of Jahangir, who at quite young age had sub succumbed to all the various kinds of addictions that he used to enjoy. And Jahangir, when he was almost dying, ordered that a portrait of his be painted so that people will remember that those who are addicted to both opium, wine, and various other narcotics would actually come to this stage. Now, in this drawing, we see a perfect, realistic rendition of a man who is dying. His face is hollow. His eyes are looking with despair, in despair at the space in front of him. The big pillows testify to his own frailty. But all in all, though a frightening picture, this is one of the most realistic rendition 
of the human figure that you can find in Mughal painting. In this, where the colors have been put in, the painting subtly undergoes a change. It now becomes an allegory of death. The face of Inayat Khan is now no longer so harrowed. He's in pain, but he seems to have made his peace with his maker. The very colorful and uh, heavy pillows that support him, though emphasize his frailty, they also lend that kind of a color, which makes this painting a very attractive one. It also becomes one of the most realistic renditions of the human figure that is to be seen in color and which was to also go down as one of the best examples of portraits in Mughal painting. Now with these two drawings and paintings of Enayat Khan, Mughal painting enters a second stage of its development. Now we have Shah Jahan. This was painted by Bichitra when Shah Jahan was 25. And he writes it down in Shah Jahan's own writing that this is a very good likeness of me painted by the painter Bichitra. He is holding up the eye grate in front of his, uh, with his hand, which signifies that he was going to be the next king. This is the court of Shah Jahan. His sons are brought to him by his brother-in-law Asaf Khan. We have the strict hierarchy of the Mughal court maintained and it is an illustration out of the Badshah Nama which is the biography of Shah Jahan which is now reserved in the Windsor Castle Library of the royal uh, uh, property of the uh, kings and queens of England. This was rarely brought out but it was one of the paintings which were shown in India, in Delhi, when the 50 years of Indian independence was being celebrated. It is, in some ways, the most important symbolic painting of the Mughal period, which shows uh, the whole of the Mughal Empire in its glory, with Shah Jahan at its head. These are four portraits of four men who hold different occupations. It is from the period of Shah Jahan onward that portraits received a kind of finish which was to be rarely achieved by any other paintings of any other country. It almost becomes like colored photographs and once again paintings become some of the most important records of the rule of these Mughal emperors. This is the portrait of an aristocratic woman. It is supposed to be imaginary, but it also testifies to the kind of imagination that the Mughal artists had and the attention that they paid to beauty and grace. This is an allegorical portrait of Shah Jahan in the middle period of his reign where he is shown as being crowned by all the powers of heaven and all the angels are holding up the crown and he is also standing on the kind of crystal globe that his father had and there is the symbolic uh, uh, expressions of the two dynasties of the Safavids, the lion and the sheep. Angels and divine signs became an important uh, part of Mughal painting to mark the auspicious ceremony. Here we have Shah Shuja and Gaj Bahadur and Shah Shuja is taking over from Gaj Bahadur as the Subadar of Bengal. And here we have the two angels holding up the canopy, which shows that this is a very important political incident in the life of the Mughal rulers. Finally, we come to a very interesting painting, which was to be found in the Mughal album. It is a painting of all the princes of the house of Timur. 
And on one side, we have Timur and then his descendants up to Baba's father. They are all painted in the classical Persian style. On the next row, we have the Mughal princes coming up to Shah Jahan. The faces of the Mughal rulers were erased and from Akbar onwards, right up to the last one, we have actual portraits inserted. This shows that even if the imagination, even if the glory of the earlier years of Timur's reign accepted by the Mughal rulers, they came to realize that in order to establish the actual rule, the material condition of their governance, they would have to be presented as actually as they were. This movement in term of uh, style towards a kind of realistic rending of the portraits also signifies the way Indian uh, people and Indianization of the superstructure was being carried out by the Mughal rulers. With the allegorical portraits of Jahangir, painted by Abul Hasan and Bichitra, we enter a definitely new phase in the way paintings could be read as parts and sources of history. With Shah Jahan, the whole message was carried forward. Achievements of the Mughal artists increased rather than decreased. They played with light and shadow. They made their figures and incidents of that narrative more lifelike. And overall, we have here an entire plethora of paintings and illustrations which show very clearly that not only the patrons but the artists were also involved in the construction of a world which was both real in some senses and at the same time it which reflected the hierarchy and the powers of an empire which was considered to have been beneficial to the people. Da 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 da